All right, so let, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming, people online. Thank you for showing up, and everybody here in live and in person. Thank you for coming. Um, this is our uh, November meeting. Our agenda, we've done uh, the dinner networking. We're going to make some, uh, some general announcements first. And then we're going to stop off for a moment for uh, some of our employee opportunities and recruiters. And then some general uh, announcements. And then we'll introduce our speaker. And then uh, he'll get straight into the topic. Okay. So we don't have any announcements other than, which at the end we'll announce again. But next month, we're going to have a panel here, a, a women's panel. It's going to be good. So if you guys if you could show up in person or online. Uh, we're gonna bring some female uh, professionals are gonna answer questions with the audience. So it'd be good if you guys even have anything in mind or any questions you'd like to post, uh, send them to me or Dathan or any of, anybody on the board and we'll make sure it gets on the, uh, the roster. Um, well, our, top, our topic, our theme is, uh, future readiness, kind of like, you know, all the AI and things coming down, you know, how does that change project controls? What does that look like? So we want to keep that theme moving forward, you know, because that's essentially that's where we're headed, right? So project controls is probably lagging and getting on board with some of the technology, but there's reasons behind that. Um, so I won't get into a lecture on that. Um, Job opportunities, so this is uh, usually where we announce uh, any job openings. If, if there's recruiters in, uh, in, in house, we'll ask them to stand up and, and provide any potential job opportunities that are out there. Usually Charlie's our, our guy that he usually uh, emails out um, opportunities to a large audience. So Charlie, I wanna give the floor to you, if that's okay. Um, I just recently received, it was yesterday, I believe it was, uh, uh, an opportunity. It was for uh, two, not one, but two PCMs. They had some restrictions in specific needs, but I sent it out to about 150 people that I have on a list that are either people that I know that have been looking, may have been looking, or a similar heart to help others and forward on to help solve that problem. But if you are not on my list, please give me a call, 713-412-2278. Repeat, 713-412-2278. And I'll be glad to forward that email that I was sent out. But I just received another one that had a total of five different positions, including project controls manager, um, mechanical, uh, several other disciplines other than project controls, but there are several in there. So I'll be glad to send it out. But I, as I have said many times, if it doesn't fit you, pass it on to somebody that may benefit. We all benefit from that. And it's, it's not who I know, but it's who you know that can help somebody else uh, uh, in this time of need. So once again, I look forward to hearing from you via the phone. Text me and your email address, and I'm going to do it that way That also. Thanks. Okay. So if, if you guys didn't catch his uh, phone number or email, just email me, and then we'll get you connected to Charlie. He also helps update our website on these opportunities. Um, so just if, you, if you're looking, stay tuned. Okay. And again, trying to get back to our, our old ways of dinner and networking. This was at the Hess Club. Currently, we're temporarily in, in my office, but uh, we'll find a venue soon in the next few months and probably change venues. All right. So I want to introduce Jason Kimbrell. He's with Omega. And his topic, I'm not even going to try and introduce your topic, but it's what to expect when you're expecting cost engineering software 
And this discussion intends to answer those questions, provided best practice guidance and lessons learned for successfully implementing digital cost management solutions on projects. Um, so I'm gonna let Jason do his intro and I'll get out of the way and let you take it from here, Jason. Sure, it's up and running. Good to go. Go ahead. Uh, well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jason Kimbrough. Um, I hope everyone can hear me on the call. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. Uh, but uh, this is my third time to speak to the AACE, uh, so I'm, I'm very honored to be asked to come back. It's also the first time uh, that I have been introduced uh, without someone calling me a young professional. So I feel like in some ways that, that qualifies me for a promotion. <laughs> so... I think it's fair to say that we are living in the future. Or at the very least, we're living in a transitionary period in our industry. For years, the hammer and nail of cost engineering, the tool that we use to do our job, the actual mechanics of how we manage cost has been done in spreadsheets. Maybe we're lucky we've got a database that we use as a repository for information. But by and large, we're still doing our jobs out of spreadsheets. And that's fine. Spreadsheets are great. I can manage a project that's $100,000 out of a spreadsheet, and I can manage a project that's $5 billion out of a spreadsheet. The reports will get done. I will give the advice to the project manager. I'll determine the reason for the variances. But everyone in this room knows that spreadsheets have problems. They're onerous. They take a lot of time and effort to update. They crash. We spend more time doing spreadsheets than we actually do cost engineering. So much that we're frequently known as that guy that works in the cubicle in the corner that knows how to make the thingy work. And we've, we've looked at Primavera, we cost engineers have, have looked at our, our, our colleagues at Primavera, we wondered, where's our tool that can make our lives easy, supposedly? And to be fair, digital cost management solutions have been around since the 90s. We've had them. But it's only, in my opinion, until recently, in the last decade or so, that they've made advances in usability, and accessibility um, that make them attractive options for cost engineers to actually manage costs on projects. And that is making them, uh, that, that um, attraction is making them uh, rapidly adopted by organizations. And that rapid adoption is leading to this paradigm shift in how we actually do cost engineering. We're changing the things that we wake up in the morning and worry about because we're changing the tool that we're actually using to do the job. And with that change comes a lot of uncertainty. I'm a cost engineer. I don't like change. Project controls means no surprises. I don't want to change away from my spreadsheet. These are all things that I said in 2018 when I was on a project um, that piloted a cost tool at Shell on the Gulf of Mexico Brownfield portfolio. I still remember my project controls manager coming to tell me, burn it. You don't need it anymore. You're going to be more efficient after this. And I had no idea what any of that meant. I had a lot of questions about, about the tool I was about to use, and I didn't get a lot of answers. So my goal tonight is to answer that for you. What do you actually get when you get a digital cost management solution? What does it offer you over the spreadsheets you might be using? If you have the tool, why aren't you using it now? What what are the benefits that you might have? What should you expect? What should change in your daily job? What stays the same? And then if you're on a, 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 an organization that's currently looking to implement one of these tools, what does an implementation actually look like? How do you get it 
from uh, how do you go from using spreadsheets and, and your current processes to actually using a cost management tool? And then along the way, what are some best practices for how you can use the tool better? But before that, this is my about me, just to let you know that my CV kind of let you know that I, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I started cost engineering in 2013. I've worked multiple projects at Shell, mostly in deep water. Uh, in LNG. Uh, in 2018, I, I was on a pilot team for uh, Shell's ecosystem implementation. Uh, I used the tool for about two and a half years. I left as kind of a subject matter expert uh, in the group I was in. Uh, and then at the end of 2020, I joined Omega to actually work on cost tools. Uh, I kind of found that was my niche in project controls. Uh, and I spent the last year implementing PIMS cost with Chevron. So I've got experience being a user of these tools and also being on the other side. So let's kind of look at the basics. Um, I come out of academia, and so I like to define everything before I talk about it. Uh, and because I know someone in the audience is gonna say, well, actually, Excel is digital. Um, when I say a digital cost management tool, I mean a product control specific piece of software that is for the express purpose of cost engineering and meets the guidance in our AACE recommended practice. Uh, if you didn't know that we have uh, a recommended practice, um, we do, and it's, it's actually pretty good. I recommend it. Yeah. Uh, but to be clear, um, when I uh, say uh, project control software, I'm not talking about Excel, if that's not clear at this point. Um, it doesn't meet uh, the AAC recommended practice. It's not specific to project controls. I'm also not talking about this. I'm not talking about SAP. I'm not talking about enterprise resource planning tools. These are finance tools. We use them. That's where we might say we've got a single source of truth. We might pull our actuals out of it. We might pull our commitments, but SAP is not a project control tool. It's not gonna give you an earned value unless it's got some functionality I haven't learned about in the last couple of years. And to provide some context, uh, on, on kind of why I say we're in a paradigm shift, um, just to give you an idea of where we've been. So this is a, a slide I used in a previous presentation, and it, it gives you an idea of um, early deliverables and cost engineering that we make every day. Um, but these are how they were made 200 years ago. Uh, so they've got a, a table of cost overruns, um, some financial curves, a work breakdown structure that's breaking things out between uh, directs and overheads. Um, which I find fascinating that in 1909, we were still trying to figure out how much owner's cost was a uh, percentage of the base. Um, but my, my point here is that um, we've been doing cost engineering for a long time. And the things that we do haven't really changed. We still make these tables every day. I made this table yesterday. So, um, but we do see shifts in the way we do this work. So we do this work by hand, and then by the, about the 1980s, computers become widely available, and um, we can start doing cost engineering through computers. Except we've been in this transition period before, and nobody wanted to use them. So as I was kind of researching this topic, uh, I, I ran across this, this great article by John Lucas called Computerizing the Cost Engineer Benefit or Ballyhoo, uh, in which he's trying to make this impassioned argument that we need to use computers in cost engineering. And it, it, um, it blows my mind <laughs> that we're still having the same conversation, but we're doing it with cost software. Like we as cost engineers do not want to change. The cost engineering profession in general has not embraced the use of the computer to the extent of other professions. I think it's because we don't like surprises, but um, this is kind of a trend for us. Uh, and this is just to use Excel to use spreadsheets, to use tools on a computer. Um, but we adopted them uh, and we've been using them for years. So now we're in kind of this third transition as far as how we, we do our job. We use cost software, or we will use cost software um, to deliver on our promises. So let's kind of talk about what it actually brings to us. Why are we making this shift? Cost software is dedicated to project controls. 
unlike a spreadsheet where you have to build it every time, kind of have to put new features into it, Kong software is a, is a specific tool set. It's designed to help you do your job better. Cost management software standardizes your ways of working. Uh, it offers a way so that everybody's doing cost engineering the same way at your company and uh, in a way kind of can enforce that. One of the things that uh, when, I, when I transitioned from working day-to-day um, -day cost engineering to working at Omega that I learned was that cost management is a subjective field. Um, and I, I don't know why it took me 10 years to figure that out, but it is. We all do it a little bit differently. We all have different terminology for things. Uh, and standardizing the way that we're actually using our tools, um, we make it easier to come up to speed on projects, less time spent trying to back into what somebody else did. Uh, these tools have uh, integration with other things that we already use, like P6 or ERP software, and so we can automate some of the more onerous tasks that we have. Uh, less copying uh, data from one spreadsheet to another, more actually analyzing what that data looks like. Software, uh, unlike Excel, where a single instance of Excel is a, a workbook, right? And we have different versions of that workbook. Cost software is on the same server, the same kind of cloud. And so we have the ability to reduce some categorization efforts that we're, we're frequently asked to do, like enterprise-wide reporting or benchmarking. Um, things that take us a long time to do, we can now mine data for, and it makes our jobs a little bit easier. And uh, last benefit, if it breaks, you don't have to fix it. That's on us. You take questions as you go or do you wait to the end? No, I'll take a question, sure. Okay. <clears throat> uh, one of the main, one of the main um, benefits of the uh, cost management software has to be single entry. That, that, that is an area exactly. that causes so many problems that you're, you're having multiple entries on the same information. One, one cost engineer has got a, uh, you know, uh, a variation, uh, variation orders log, another mm -hmm. one's got an, a separate variation order request log. And, uh, you know, all, all, all these type of things got to be the single entry. And by having the single system, that has to be one of the ma major benefits of single. Yeah, it is absolutely one of the game changers in how your life changes. Um, so uh, because it's single entry, you can actually do things like, like trending, um, and, and change management in a, in a more granular way. You're not having to go, you know, copy down what your, your variance was, make the variance log. It's all on the same tool. Mm. Um, there are a couple downsides to, uh, to cost software. Um, it is not as flexible as, as Excel, uh, and it will never be as flexible as Excel uh, because it's standardized. You standardize something, that's what you, you give up. Like you, can't you can't, you can't. But that's also a benefit. Yeah. <laughs> um, change is unpleasant, uh, and these software tools don't operate the same way that we do cost engineering now. Uh, you will have to change something about your job, and so that's going to hurt. I know I had to change the way I did my work. <laughs> I cursed the whole time. The important thing is I didn't give up. Uh, and cost software is not a silver bullet for pro bad project controls. Uh, if your organization doesn't have good project controls, software <laughs> could probably make it worse. Uh, at the same token, you, you can help you unify the way that you do your jobs, but it's not going to be push a button and here's my project. How do you do that? How do you do that if something's set and it's just here and it's on the form and it says this is it and it says 1095? Well, now it must be 1595. Same thing. Same way we do it now. We, we manage our baselines, we manage our estimates. So, so, so you have to go in and, and implement it on the next thing that happens. Right. So one of the things that does change, um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kind of skip that one and kind of come down here, is this kind of idea of top down, uh, less bottom up, and more details. So the way that um, cost software tends to work and how it kind of changes your life around is that um, 
tools like um, like SAP or, or the way we kind of use Excel tend to have um, this kind of idea that we're going to have this cost and we're going to call it a, a we're going to say it's a control account but really it's just a, a bucket of money for a scope of work and then as that scope of work kind of increases or decreases we might draw down from a more general bucket um, and cost software is meant to be kind of at this detailed level so you build a detailed breakup uh, detailed breakdown of your estimate and, and uh, work breakdown structure. And then you can track changes against that using baselines. So as you change from month to month, you can see as you're shifting up and down. It's part of that kind of automatic thing, right? You can still track the variances the same way we do with Excel. It's just automatic, it flags it for you. So if we went up 50%, you're still going to have to make a decision about it going up but you can make those decisions based on performance indicators that you get from earned value management which is easier to do you know, the way that cost software can handle details as opposed to a spreadsheet where you might be measuring it at a, a higher level because it's just that's the battlefield project controls. Are, are you asking more of escalation in regard to escalation? Yeah, I'm an escalation. Yeah, escalation. I'm seeing the steel. I'm not making it on this slide. Oh, I'm just going to point. So, the way I track things like that. So, being in an Excel spreadsheet, and correct me if I'm wrong, sir. Being an Excel spreadsheet, if I have, I have to track every individual line item, exactly what you're saying. If I know this commodity changes, that commodity fluctuates, I've got geo parity, all these sorts of things. I have the influence going to every single line item. The fantastic part I find with a lot of the cost management system, whether it's an ecosystem, whether it's a prism, whether it's however, whatever you want, you generally have the ability to start grouping those fluctuations and those. Uh, Geo parities or, or, or escalations to the different types of commodities. So, all of a sudden, you can now control how your costs fluctuate to a commodity rather than going individual one of them. So, you, so make sure you don't forget things as well. Now, you're still going to have to look at whatever the, the, the changes are. Of course, you are. I mean, whatever you see, your contract at this month might be putting in labor rates a certain amount to next month, but there's a shortage. Or I'm in the middle of the Midwest trying to find electricians and paying that I might go and see them that money to come and work on my particular project. Uh, always makes me want to get back out of project management, sorry, and go back on to being an electrician, but that's fine. But so it, it's and being able to track and monitor those. Now that'll look well up, but this runs into start looking at trend, starts looking into your trend programs and you find your cotton to change that in the project. So, and all these sets my baselines and my baselines are always evolving. So mm -hmm. when I say baseline, my estimating baselines always evolve. Like my data my data queue of of uh, cost of each commodity for everything that I'm tracking for when I'm building my next estimate, I'm able to control it a lot more bigger, a lot more there's a lot more control around it. And that's where the system will come into place. Now I used to do that in the 90s with all the next top two. Dealing back with cigarette packet. But so yeah now, I don't have to worry about missing the different components of it. And that's one of the, the things that um, sort of, sort of um, to, to bring up that story, I saw the project control manager telling me, you know, bring a spreadsheet, you're going to be more efficient. Um, but we kind of hear this idea that your focus shifts from data entry towards analysis. And if I were going to say that the number one thing that changes for you is you're spending more time on analysis. But analysis kind of gets presented like you're, you're pouring over these reports. And then you're writing like an English major report and you're handing it to a project manager. And that analysis really takes the shape of making those decisions about where that trend is going. It's determining a better estimate at completion, determining a better path that you're, you're going down versus just trying to see where you've been. That's the, at least to me, that's the number one thing that changed uh, when I moved to it. Now that said, because it's top down, because I'm thinking of things as, as a whole, as opposed to like a, um, you know, I'm going to go in Excel and phase out my costs and then uh, hit sum and then sum up the cells to get my EAC. Um, I can still do that, but these tools work better when you go. Um, it does take a little bit of change. It does take looking at these details because the details are really where these tools um, start to drive change.
uh, it will make you more productive, but not at first. Uh, and that's part of it, right? These tools are different from what we're used to seeing. Uh, and so it's going to be a little bit of time to come up to speed with them. So this is what stays the same. You're still doing cost engineering. Hasn't changed. We're still doing trending. We're still doing variances. We're still looking at how uh, we're going to end up at the end of the day. Just a different tool. Not everything is automatic. Uh, Automate the automatic things in uh, cost software tend to be the things that are kind of background noise. Then this is what I mean by that. So if you have a, um, a scope of work that's $5 million and your total EAC is $6 million, you're going to spend more time looking at that $5 million piece of work. You're going to manage that manually in some ways. You're going to do a lot more with hands on with that scope of work. But the stuff that costs $200. You know, the little change you can set to be automatic. You can give it its own curves. You can let the system draw out how it's going to be phased and be smart about what you decide that you want to automate in your job. You're not going to kill every spreadsheet. They don't go away. You might use spreadsheets to load cost into one of these systems. Uh, more likely, you've got something that you're keeping on the side. It's just easier to access. Um, I used to keep a lot of SAP um, downloads um, just on the fly because they were quicker to access than out of my tool. Every spreadsheet doesn't go away. There will also still be ad hoc reports that you've, you know, you've got to do something with. Um, the software will make you more efficient, uh, but I think it needs to be said that it's not going to eliminate you. Your job doesn't go away because you've got software. Um, it will make your job easier, but it's, not, it's more of an augmentation. We're just changing the tool. So from that, uh, I think that's kind of what changes uh, when you actually start using these tools. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is really, if, you, if you're on the path towards implementing one of these tools, what does that implementation process actually look like? And through that implementation, what are some best practices you can take away? Why are you using a cost management tool, whether it's PIMS cost or, or ecosys or, or PRISM? So uh, when I started uh, on the, uh, uh, on the shell project, I didn't have a good idea of what that implementation would be like. Uh, and I also wasn't involved in every process of it. Um, and so what I like about this chart, um, it comes out of our recommended practice and it kind of gives you an idea of what every step of the way kind of kind of looks like. Um, I would make uh, one slight revision to it. Um, and that's that it's not necessarily a step, it's a linear, I'm gonna go here, 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 and here. It kind of kicks off and then it's like this big loop here. Kind of a feedback loop as, as you start to use the software and you, you know what you want to configure with it. Uh, but typically um, you'll start with a readiness assessment uh, and that readiness assessment is basically you doing a good old-fashioned kind of kaizen if you're familiar with like lean management you're just going to go see what you're doing now look at all the tools that you're using all the inputs the outputs you put together a set of recommendations and um, talk to IT about what you what you can and can't do with software <laughs> because your organization will have different security requirements. Um, and at the end of that, um, you'll send those requirements out to bid to a couple of software companies. They'll give you demos. You'll pick the one that's right for your organization. And then we'll move into this installation phase um, where the software developer comes in. We do a bit of scoping with you, understand your requirements, actually configure the software to, to work with your company. Uh, and then um, from there, you go into a pilot where you're piloting uh, your, your software, uh, your team comes back, they say, yeah, this works, and then you go and you implement it. It all sounds like it's a very easy, easy process, uh, and there's nothing to it. Um, but what you kind of find is that um, organizations that have success with these tools make a lot of decisions during implementation that have ripple effects later on. Um, and that first kind of ripple effect that I find is uh, having right people in the room while you're doing this, uh, any step of this implementation. You wanna have a good mix of, uh, that's representative of the, the users uh, of the tool, focusing on that practitioner that's gonna be in the tool every day, 
Uh, and you also want to make sure you've got subject matter experts and management to play umpire so that the practitioners don't have some kind of battlefield project controls that they've used as a band-aid and want it in the tool. Uh, you also want to make sure you've got IT involved. We are not, uh, as project controllers, uh, IT people. We are uh, we're project controllers. Um, but IT can advise on some of the pieces that we don't know about. Um, and then you'll have uh, software developers and stakeholders, different people that you want to be able to see the tool um, to uh, make sure that it's meeting their needs as well. Uh, within your readiness assessment, I'm kind of deep diving into that. Uh, your, your goal is to understand what your processes are uh, before you even request a demo. Um, one of the things that, that um, sometimes you see is that uh, with, with implementations is that uh, folks want to just kind of jump in to using the software without actually understanding what they're doing now, um, which is, I mean, it's fine, you're using the software, but you're, you're likely to come in and say, hey, I need to go change this around and change this around and change this around. Um, the whole point of this is to kind of understand what, what you actually need it to do uh, before you even start working. Um, as you're kind of uh, looking through your options, you'll put together your list of requirements. Uh, those requirements uh, kind of form the basis of, of what we'll do demos around as you shop, uh, shop, your, shop around a different uh, folks, software developers. Um, we can even, if you're, if you're comfortable sharing things like, um, like work breakdown structures you already use or, or, or dead projects or example projects, you can even have those demoed to you and um, see what your tool might look like uh, using your data. Um, but generally what happens is uh, as you come to the end of this one, um, you'll, you'll do two things. You'll pick the software that you're gonna go with and they'll issue that, that purchase order and that'll move us to that next stage. Um, I think it's a best practice at this point to make sure you know the pilots that you're going to use when you actually implement the software. Um, and picking pilots, you want something representative of your whole organization uh, and probably more than one project. So three to five um, projects or portfolios um, that you can uh, reliably say make up about 80% of the work that you do. Because uh, different cost engineers do things differently. Uh, and you, Someone that's working in turnarounds is probably going to do something incredibly different from someone that's working in sub -city. If you go in implementation from the software perspective, you know what the readiness should look like. And if the client doesn't have that in place, the other one can come out and say, you don't have a WPS custom team, whether it's a WPS uh, implementation. Phase by segment or even cross protocol. It'll come out. So that next piece of that of this installation piece would be in, in installation and configuration. But um, yeah, I mean, we would we would point out, hey, do you have an example of this or an example of that? If you haven't put it in that requirement, right? We have kind of boilerplate stuff that we'll do, um, but it's it's much easier if we have those requirements that um, where we can kind of tailor to to what you need. Jackson, you can elaborate just before you get into the detail. Elaborate who are the right people. That's the one that I always have loved this argument about. <laughs> um, so, I, uh, in my who to include, I would include uh, the project controlled management. So, these are the, the people that are actually driving the best practices at your organization. Um, they're the ones that uh, kind of see the day to day, oversee the day to day cost engineers. You want subject matter experts that uh, can play umpire to everybody in the room. Um, and then you want, uh, at least in this stage, a good mix of your entire cost engineering community. Not everybody, because it's too many, you're gonna get too many requirements. Um, but uh, you wanna have a good basis of, of the folks that are really doing that job. Uh, and then IT manager as well. One I'd add to that is the actual end recipient stuff. So, yeah, so this, the, the, no, no, no. There's, yeah. there's a different note. Are you talking from stakeholders? I'm, so, I'm talking about the people who are going to take the benefit of the cost manager or the cost team. Because the biggest, played around with a few different programs in different countries mm -hmm. and companies. What I've found, unless you have those end users, and I think I say end users, the end recipients or the vendor of the, of the system, you will always get pushed back in that system. So the current local company I'm working with, um, 
quite interesting. I asked, they've, they've introduced this new system. I've never heard of it before. I got into it, I asked a few questions, and then I went, okay, the first person I want to talk to is PMs, the project managers, and the guys who were delivering it. Mm -hmm. And I said, why did you choose the subword? The first person I said, if we weren't involved. And so day one, you're going to learn. So unless you have the people who this is actually going to benefit, Okay, I totally agree. Project controls, when right. some day to day, absolutely, IT, yeah, all those important. But unless you're involving the people who are going to take the benefit of this, you're going to have a struggle, especially to a kid that's off. Yeah, absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the, So, from that uh, readiness phase, you kind of move into this installation and configuration. Uh, we'll do a scoping session. The software developer will do a scoping session with you to kind of understand those requirements, um, to get a better idea of, of what you need. Uh, and we'll take that, uh, probably poke a couple of, uh, try to poke as many holes as we can into it. Um, really try to understand everything that you, you, you need. We'll configure the tool for you um, based on those requirements. Part of that configuration is going to include things like what kind of dashboards and reports you're, you're looking for. Um, also, kind of things like um, if you're going to do some special coding, right? So if you're going to try and use a, like the ISO 19008, which is a, a benchmarking uh, code of accounts, um, that's where you kind of introduce that and how you want it to be, be shown in your software. Um, we'll make some decisions here. Uh, things that uh, IT can help you out with as well. So things like which software you want to connect to, whether you want to use like a direct access through some kind of API or if you want to use a data lake or data warehouse. Um, and sort of as this is going on, it's going to overlap a bit, about 80% through uh, with your training and your, your pilot projects. Uh, and I say that it'll be when you're 80% through because when, those when the training and pilot projects start going, they're going to have opinions about what needs to kind of go into this. Um, so it does become this kind of feedback. Uh, in this, um, this kind of section, we start to kind of hear this term out of the box. At least I did a lot uh, whenever I was uh, implementing the tool and I still hear it. Um, so what does out of the box actually mean? Uh, means that you're not going to customize or enhance the tool. You're going to take it off <laughs> to use another idiom, off the shelf, uh, and you're just going to use it as it was intended to be used. Uh, and we, as uh, software developers, tend to like that uh, because it means that it's easier to fix bugs and to upgrade you. Um, every enhancement you do kind of locks you out of uh, upgrades later um, because it means you specialize something to your, your organization. Uh, and so out of the box is typically cheaper for you and faster to get up and running than it is to do a, a massive amount of configuration. The reality is though that uh, out of the box is just an aspiration. Uh, typically uh, implementations are, are not 100% off the shelf. Um, there's always something that we configure, um, such as if you have an advanced ERP interface that you, you, you have, um, you have some business process requirements, maybe you have some inputs that um, or atypical um, or some highly specific reports. Um, sometimes those are the kinds of um, customizations or advanced configurations that, that you, might, you might go with. There's a general principle, um, adapt to the software, uh, don't adapt the software to you. Um, you can run into a lot of trouble the more that you try to customize the software. Um, you can make it into a real science project uh, and nobody will ever want to use it because it's been so specialized. Um, the other thing to keep in mind during this phase, uh, automation is a double-edged sword. Please use it wisely. You can very easily shoot yourself in the foot between these two things, adapting the software and automating. Um, so one of the, the better uh, automations that, that I've, um, or configurations that kind of automated things for me that I, I really liked was around uh, Shell doing a, a work breakdown structure that was standard to our portfolio. And so um, when we created a new project, it would just automatically populate a work breakdown structure. And all I had to do was go input my work packages and arrange the work as it needed to be. Um, an automation that might not work very well is if you're relying on SAP to be um, your um, source of your work breakdown structures. 
Uh, we as cost engineers sometimes break work out into ways that SAP doesn't track, or maybe SAP tracks um, two work package would create two work packages to track the same scope of work. Um, something you can do, uh, it's nothing wrong with it, um, but SAP is still not a, a project controls tool. Uh, we'll move from there into user training and pilot projects. Um, typically that first training is done by the software developer. Uh, it'll involve a lot of stuff that is out of the box. Um, it lasts about a week if I'm doing it. Uh, I like to do about two hours a day so that people can go do their job. Um, but during that, uh, that training, um, I think it's a, a useful kind of practice, especially kind of um, uh, as, as you guys start to take on the, the tool uh, and your own training as you roll the software out is to kind of keep a, a, a running uh, parking lot of items associated with uh, that training. So um, it'd be like a, a parking lot built, it's just a, it's a whiteboard that you split into three columns. Uh, one column would say to clarify, and that clarify column gives you stuff that you can put inside your, your procedures and your practices that you're um, likely going to need to shift around as you as you adapt software. Um, you would have a column for enhancements. Um, so that way you can kind of park uh, conversation topics like, boy, it'd be great if the tool could do this that might derail training. Um, and then another one for bugs because the bugs will get fixed, but frequently I just find that you find bugs pop up in these The length of time that you're going to do the pilot is going to vary based on your organization. If you've got a large organization, it's going to last longer, probably include more projects. If you have only one project in your organization, your pilot is your project. I think there's a couple of things that um, pilot teams can do, and I think they're just great um, best practices for using cost management software. Uh, one is getting that project structure right. Um, Cost software, um, typically, because it's, it's based around this idea of kind of going from the, the top down rather than the bottom up, um, it, it bases a lot on how your project is actually structured. So what kind of control accounts are you using on a project? What kind of work packages are you using? Have you broken the scopes of work out to small enough pieces so that you can actually manage the, the variances that you're gonna be asked about? Um, or um, have you broken them out too small so that you're swimming in detail? Um, that focus on project structure, if you can get that right, um, you'll have a good time using these tools. But that being said, don't be scared to mess them up. Uh, because the more that you break the tools, the better that we can make them. Because uh, we, we find issues with them. Uh, you can also uh, learn through mistakes. And there's nothing that you can't fix later on, at least that I've found. I've never found anything in these tools that is so bad we have to completely blow something up. Uh, run, two spread, uh, run a spreadsheet in parallel for at least the first two cycles when you're adopting the tool. Um, this is kind of a, a nice uh, rule of thumb. Um, one, it, it helps you because you get to run your spreadsheet and it, it's nice and comfortable. But two, you get the answers in the back of the book so you can see if the software is actually doing what you want it to do. Um, but don't, if you find the software is getting the same answer, don't run it for more than two months. Abandon the spreadsheet or it'll become a crux. Uh, speak up. If you're on that pilot team and you find that there's something that's going on, um, you don't like it, say something about it. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the, the mistakes that I made uh, on, the, on the Shell's pilot team, um, if I found that there was a bug in the software, instead of reporting it, I would find a workaround. Uh, and so what I found is that by the time we finished that pilot, I had a really kind of screwed up idea of how the software was supposed to work. Uh, and it turns out they're actually not built to be that complex um, to use. Uh, and then this is more aimed at uh, organizations have multiple super users and champions. The, an ulterior motive for this pilot, aside from knowing the software works for you, is to make uh, to end by having some super users and people that other people can go rely on as you implement the software later. Um, don't be in a position where you only have one person that knows how the tool works and then that person leaves. 
because it's not pleasant. Uh, and then finally, you're, you're ready to go. You've done your pilots. You can implement and roll out the, the software. Um, within this kind of phase, uh, I think it's useful to have a, a plan that consists of two, two kind of broad things. One is a, a training plan so that you can bring other people on board and that you guys are running your own trainings. Um, the other one is uh, to have a kind of categorization for which projects are really candidates to use the tool that you just configured. Um, I'm of the opinion that a, a no project is too early in its phase to, um, to, to use project control software, uh, but I think projects can be too late. So if it's your project's five years into execution, you got a year left, probably not a good idea to move them into the tool, even if it's for completion's sake. But earlier projects, like these phase one projects, phase two, phase three, when you're just doing feed engineering or even before that, those are great because they never get the bad habits that spreadsheets build up. Um, I think, um, so when you're ready, uh, the question I, I've kind of been asked is when am I ready to actually we're gonna, um, roll this software out? Uh, and I think these two questions, if you can answer yes to both of these, you're probably ready. One is, is your data the same? So if you're doing work in a spreadsheet and you're doing work in the tool, the data is the same, I think you're ready. Right, we know the tool works. Uh, can you perform the most critical tasks to cost management? Uh, so can you go through the tool, do changes, perform a month's close, go through your entire reporting cycle? Maybe you have to use Excel or some other tool to do a monthly report, but you can get the job done within the tool. I think you're ready at that point. I would add probably one extra one in here that I left off um, is to do you have the training in place? Is there a documentation and something that someone can rely on so that if they have questions about it, they know what to do? And as you roll that out, uh, it's useful to have some active metrics to measure success. Um, so maybe not just counting the number of users of a tool or the number of projects in, in that system, but thinking about who was active in the last 30 days or the number of projects you have that actually closed a cycle last month. Um, this kind of gives you a, an idea of not just the kind of sp spectrum of uh, what your tool is you doing, um, but also gives you an idea of just how successful, how much people are using it. And then with that, that's, uh, that's I think what you have to expect when you're expecting a cost management system. There's people online who want to ask. I have a question. Yes. What is, if you have a general um, productivity differential between, like, when you're saying run in parallel mm -hmm. and drop one, so if you had to say what's obviously the time that you're spending putting the data through the system versus the analytical time before and after. You know, kind of roughly, in general, what the difference it's, is done? It's almost a, a subtle shift. So, I mean, think, um, if I had to kind of put time on it, um, I would have spent an entire day loading actuals into a spreadsheet. And that's all I would have done during that day, is I would have gone to my spreadsheet, copied the data from SAP, put it in the right cell, do a formula so that any of the variances for the next month get reversed out, so I hold the EAC. Um, within these tools, you can do that instantly. Um, that kind of savings, I'd say you're really getting to like, you know, four or five days a month that you were previously spending on kind of this data entry and fixing stuff that you're now spending on this analysis. And that's like an off the top of my head thing. It's not scientific. It's just me thinking about what I actually save when I was using the tools. Always on the user side, so whenever we implement something, we sort of twenty percent of time. And what was more, what was actually more, more sort of better was the fact that that twenty percent time that we gained, we actually spent more time analyzing the data, and that was the key. If I can stop being a desk job or a, a database job and actually spending time and actually doing what project control will pay the big money for, should allocate. Yeah, so that was what we found. 
So you might be that 20, if I could spend 20%, if you could think, if you could spend 20% more of your time analyzing data now than you were before, it's got to be tenfold. I will say though that it is, if you're running that spreadsheet in parallel with uh, the system, it, it can be, a, it, it's, it, it is very painful. And I had some colleagues that I know did that and even years into the implementation. Uh, I mean, I've been on the Chevron implementation for um, about a year. I'd say we've been doing that in earnest for maybe eight months. They're very close to the, the done. At Shell, um, the Gulf of Mexico brownfield one took about six months before I would say I was using the tool every day. Yeah, I mean, I think they've gotten a lot better. Um, I mean, I can I can tell you that. Um, so when I when I joined Omega, I, I mean, I, I've seen what our tool was like before I joined. Um, we we were on a like a, a Windows version of, of Omega, uh, Penn's cost, and then we we moved into a web version that is such an entirely different user experience, uh, both in like the, the functionality. Uh, of what it can do and then how you actually interact with it that I mean it's like they're two entirely different systems um, and that was done I want to say within the last three years so it's a how rapid much, advancement how much training of the managers not training the practitioners mm -hmm. training the people that are going to start getting the reports and so when you say managers, do you mean like the project, kind of, manager, the project managers? managers? The, end, the, end, the end recipient. I haven't been doing much training with the end recipient. I've, I've in, so with, with my job, I'm typically working with the practitioners. Um, I would say it's probably, I'm probably not the best person to be able to answer that question um, within Omega. So, so Omega doesn't have a standard. No, we uh, offering the teams, the managers have to use these reports and just start seeing the system. No, we do. Um, I'm just not the best person to answer that question because I typically work with practitioners as a as a cost specialist. Short answer is not enough. Yeah, I mean that's my experience because most of the time they don't know what to do. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's one biggest issue. So with all the teams that I have with multiple clients, my first question is have you been shown what this does? And I, I've, I've gone to engineering managers and said, all right, here's all your deliverable base. Here's how we're doing the management. Here's how we're going to do all our, uh, uh, our progress improvements, all this good stuff. Showed them gated systems, showed all those sorts of things. And they go, wow, why? What, what does this mean? I'm like, I'm like, sorry, hang on. You've never done this before? One guy was an engineering manager for 32 years. Right? And I said, oh, show me the system. I'm not going to give you my updates. I said, why not? You just beat me over the head with it when I'm wrong. I'm going, wait a No, I'm going to please. My job is here. Well, exactly. Well, and it, it took me several months just to convince the guy, look, let me show you. I'll work with you. I'll, I'll say, you can blame me if it's wrong. Right? And when we got to work with it, he started to understand, hang on, this is actually helping me predict and helping me answer questions I know I'm going to get. And then all of a sudden, he's now the first person who comes and knocks on my door and says, can you know, stop that data mark? Can you see? I'm to you now because I've got it one do again. I mean, it's fantastic. But so this is where I'd love to see with all that is the software, any type of system is put in place, whether it's cost management software. I mean, everyone knows P6. Everyone can spell P6, but I don't know what it means or what it does or what it shows. Oh, no, it's my scheduling software. Because red is bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, my favorite one is, oh, do you know what about earned value management? Absolutely. Explain it to me. And I bet you people, are, one out of 10 can explain actually what it means. It's just three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
But even that, but it's what it means and what it can do for you. And that's where I think it's missed. There's a business idea there, Jason. No, I just teach I'm, people how to use the software. What, I, what I'm hearing here is the project managers, if they were more engaged in this, they would know what else could, I mean, they, they probably have a need that hasn't been spoken yet. If you're only talking up to the control teams as your the highest level, when the public manager said, mm -hmm. you could hear that gasp, you know, I could do this, I can get this information. I'm sorry, you get the best, So getting buy-in from those people. The best project, the best project managers, project directors are, are ex-project controllers. Yes. Time and money. Agreed. Okay, don't think what else says, I'll argue yourself, black and blue, time and money. So it's not really, doesn't matter what hell well you mention here a job, you're not allowed to kill anyone, by the way. That's just a given. We're not even argue that. But, but if, if you can control your time and money, then you will win. It's simple. It's just, just building on that. I mean, the, the big stumbling blocks I've seen in, in implementing software, and unfortunately, I've seen some really you know tough implementations that have some big problems, and it's always around managing the change, <laughs> which means managing the expectations of the stakeholders. Uh, and it also in terms of who's in the room, how often they're in the room, because developers go away or or the experts go away and, and they do something and they, they come back and say, oh, it's finished, but no input in between is the I'll, I'll, I'll take one step further. Yeah. Understanding expectations from the user is the biggest thing for me, but it's actually getting that user to understand his own expectations. Like, I expect it to do this, this, and this. Right. Do you know what this, this, and this means? And what can it do to benefit you? And how can you use it? I mean, simple questions. So, I drive a car to work every day. I don't know how it all works, but I know I can get in, I can drive it. But I have an expectation that it's going to get me where I want to go safely and at a certain amount of time. It's the same thing. I don't need to know what's under the hood. I just need to understand how can I use the tool? Or how can I use the product? Yeah, that's thinking like a sidetrack. That's great. <laughs> well, I, I, I kind of think of that your project manager. I mean, this this is all the, the reason for dashboards. You've got you know the specialists, the the planners, the cost engineers. They're all hired to do to be the users. The you know to go into that detail and flag things. Or if there's a dashboard that will flag those things which are at the top end. That's a project manager shouldn't be going in learning all the. I mean, yes, they should understand uh, all, all, all the terminology and what's being presented to them, but it's the you know the key performance indicators that, 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 that they're seeing on dashboards, and it's all that it's all that aggregation of information that that, that the, the, the cost engineer or the planner's done for the project manager to go in and just look at his dashboards and okay, understand. crap, it's red. Yeah. You know, like but, but, but understand what he's reading. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's getting that, getting that aggregated information to in the right level so, so that he can, you know, take that holistic or helicopter approach to... to uh, and he can dig in where he needs to. Yeah, absolutely. It yeah. doesn't have to be an expert. So I'm not an expert of course, where I have my car looks, but mm -hmm. I, if there is something wrong, a red light yeah, we feel it, right? Yeah. I know, red look right, you're even better. You feel it. Yeah. How, many, how many times have you gone to a project manager who's like 6,000 years old, he walks up and that's going to be four weeks later. How the hell do you know that? We haven't even started yet. I've been there before, I've seen it. I know exactly what's going to happen. That contract's going to do that. He's going to blame him. And all of a sudden, that delivery is it's not going to work. And you sit there going, no, nah, no. Nah. And all of a sudden, six mm -hmm. weeks later, he goes, oh, yeah. I would, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that the, the solution that we are implementing right now with Chevron is the, it's a full Omega 10 suite. So it's not just cost. I tend to focus on cost because that's what I do. I'm a cost specialist, so I, I work with the practitioners and, and stuff. But I do, it, it does touch everybody. So for example, we, we do have a, a management of change suite that we've implemented and, and they're definitely involved in that. I've done training with that. Um, but just to be clear, I mean, that's what I, I do. I'm more of a specialist with project control. So that's, my, that's my experience. All right, guys, a couple of questions. I see the six in the chat. Uh, uh, I've been chatting a lot of online, making sure that they didn't have any questions. Um, I want to thank 
Jason, this is your gift you brought tonight. <laughs> Shane, Shane gave him the gift, and then that was for you. Thank you for. Uh, uh, Thank you guys for showing up. Make sure you guys put sandwiches. Yeah, I love that. Take uh, take some sandwiches, please, because there's a bunch left over. Guys online, thank you for joining. And uh, we'll we'll mail you the sandwiches. Yeah.